Yo, what up, what up, what up? You know what you're checking out? Scoop B Radio. It's your boy Styles Peter Ghost, L-O-X-D Block. You want the scoop? You need to see Scoop B. Yeah! Scoop B Radio available on all streaming platforms. I'm your host, Brandon Scoop B Robinson. Found on all platforms, Twitter, Instagram, everywhere in between, at Scoop B. You know his motion when you got SP to go. Styles P joins his brother. What's going on? What's good, King? How you feel? M- trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents, as the old folks would say. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Not, not a thing. Not a thing. Brother, um, you, as a collective, the group, as well as Mary J. Blige, definitely put Hawkins on the map. On a scale of 1 to 10, how proud of, are you of you guys as a collective in doing that? Uh, I got to add my brother, God bless the dead, DMX, in there, too. Sir? Uh, I would say incredibly proud. I mean, you know, uh, shout out to our big sis, Mary, for the assistant getting us on. Mm-hmm. And um, even shout out to X. We wouldn't be with Rough Riders if it wasn't for X. Mm-hmm. So they both played uh, major and intricate parts in our career. Before we put Yonkers on the map, you know, Yonkers is literally next door to the Bronx. Like, you're in the Bronx, across Broadway, you're in Yonkers. Uh, same with Bronx River Parkway and all of that. So for years, they hear everybody shout it out and um, salute, God bless. Also, Heavy D was from Mount Vernon. P Rock and Seal Smooth was from Mount Vernon. Brand Newbie is New Rochelle. So to always hear Yonkers get skipped over when you're listening to the radio and you're missing a shout out was always a. Uh, something that kind of bothered us and gave us a chip on our shoulder, which helped us get to where we're at now. Styles, I think you're slept on lyrically. I, I, I don't know if that's more of a, a fan discussion or if that's an, an artist discussion. Did you ever buy into that on your lyrical prowess? Oh, I don't really buy into it. I feel like I work for certain people. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, I think certain people have an understanding of of my content and how I how I put it down. Uh, as far as artists, um, it, there's a, there goes the saying, I'm your favorite rapper's favorite rapper. So there that goes. As far as uh, MCs, they always uh, list me when they list their favorite MCs. And I don't feel my content is, is for everybody. There's a, it, it's two parts of me. Like, you know what I mean? You have the, where you get the hard bars and then you have the part where you get the conscious. And then you also, there's actually three parts, then you get the hippie flow. So I don't, really, I don't really ever feel uh, slept on. I feel like what I say, I'm not everybody's cup of tea, and I'm not supposed to be because I don't, I don't, I don't aim to be. So if you, if you vibe with me, you vibe with me. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. I think it's a. Uh, I think some people put out material that they intend for to reach everyone. Uh, I think you have to be on a certain brainwave or, or a spiritual wave to even get where I'm coming from. So I don't I don't really consider myself for everybody. So I don't, you know, I always get my flowers and, uh, you know, being called a legend is good enough. So I, I don't want to I don't need to overdo it. Like, you know what I mean? Simply put, you ain't for everybody. You ain't trying to be. And you know who your tribe is. Yeah, basically, you. you <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah but it's interesting because it's a double-edged sword because as you mentioned and i'll reiterate there are people who who consider you in their top 10 all time um was there a point in your career where you realized your impact on culture or did you always just run your race I, I think uh, I don't want to race. I stay on the journey. So, you know, I think being on the journey lets you know, uh, you know, this music thing, it, it starts as a hobby. Then if you're fortunate enough, you get a job. Then if you're fortunate enough, you make a career out of it. Then if you're fortunate enough, you get uh, considered a legend. I always just felt like it goes back to earlier. I, I do it for I do it for certain people. So to be able to have a uh, some sort of cultural impact. It it's not like I I aimed for it, but it's like it, it things just. I believe things fall in place as you go on your journey. As you go on on your journey and you grow and mature, certain things fall in place and you uh you get in where you fit in. Like you know what I mean. I've never been one to really do worry about anybody else's lane. I'm more of a create my own lane type of guy. So uh, 
I always had a, a ton of confidence and an overbelief in myself, to be honest with you. So I think with that comes along, you know that that's going to happen eventually one way, one way or the other. And then uh, when you're in the game and you have some of the top people saying you are one of their favorites and, and respect your work, that, that also gives you a sense of knowing what you're here for. And I think when you know what you're here for, then you do what you have to do and then find other things you're here for as well. I said, I, I'm interested in the early days of you, um, your your flow. Um, did your flow come naturally to you? I would say, yeah, no. I had to, like, a, I don't write rhymes and people think it's a like a braggadocious thing because nowadays it's like, I don't write, so it's, a, you know, sort of braggadocious. I never really wrote because I couldn't, as a youngin, I couldn't, I couldn't remember. I have an offbeat, onbeat flow sometimes, and it's an onbeat, onbeat. So I never could really, when I was young, I would look at the rhyme I wrote and be like, I don't know what this says. And then uh, I've always worked, uh, <laughs> I've worked stock jobs in the job outside for a lot of years. So you didn't, I didn't have any time to be, be writing rhymes. So it was more so I, I practiced. I learned to practice what I was saying for so long that it became secondhand nature. So the flow, I think, you know, uh, it, it comes from just years of years of practicing on remembering what I'm saying and how I want to say it. And then I think a lot of people, something a lot of people don't really realize about uh, the MC's flow it has a lot to do with your passion on how or what you're saying. So the passion and the fire in your gut plays part of how how you lay it out because a flow is no different than uh for me we 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 tend to look at it like it's a a conversation so right. say if we're having a conversation and we're 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 having a good conversation it's going to have certain ebbs and flows certain vibrations to it if you're talking to somebody you don't want to talk to it's kind of low if you're angry and you're speaking to somebody you want somebody to get your point it's kind of high so with, with when you're rhyming it's a mixture of all of that at once. So you got to know when to be even, when to go high, when to go low, when to when to say somebody say something that you know is gonna impact the person. It's like no matter how you're talking, how you're talking, or who you're talking to. You know, if I say uh, say you, I bumped into you outside and you didn't like me or something, and you're like, "Fuck you," I don't I don't believe you. Like you know what I mean? But if you like, "Fuck you," like. I believe you now, but you know what I mean? So I believe it's how you put things makes people believe what you're saying okay. or not believe what you're saying. And in the, in the world of AI, uh, it's definitely, definitely getting harder and harder to tell who, who, what's what, and more. <laughs> yeah, this is getting crazy. Who were guys that you either admired or even maybe took a little bit of this or a little bit of that? In? Rakim, King, Fuji, and KRS. He said that without hesitation. Yeah, I think those those four, and there's there's so many others. Uh, EPMD, MC Light, Latifah, Ultra Magnetic, Jungle Brothers, De La Soul, but Rakim, King, Kuji, and KRS, I feel, are the epitome of all of the Golden Era MCs. I feel they laid, you know, it, it, rap is an art form. Uh, it's a verbal art form, so. If you was to ask me, those are the, the the golden era made a bunch of Bruce Lees, mm -hmm. and those guys are the master ips, the ones who trained the Bruce Lees, the ones who 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 knew style and and delivery and performance and wordplay before the likes of uh, guys like us, X, Big, Hov, Nas. You know, I believe those four are the reason all of us exist. Uh, Wu Tang. I believe those four MCs are the, are the reason why you had so many great MCs in the 90s era. Man. Um, your catalog, to me, as, as an individual and even the locks all the way down to the D-Block mixtape era uh, is, is, is um, uncanny. Is Thank it, you. Uh, sir, is it possible to have a favorite locks song or a favorite locks project? Uh, I'm going to say we didn't make it yet. <laughs> My favorite isn't made yet. I like to keep that mind state, but uh, I love We Are The Streets for what it stands for. I love performing uh, Fuck You. 
I love performing Money, Power, Respect. Uh, I love performing Wild Out. I love performing We're Gonna Make It. It's just something about the energy that doing those certain songs create and, and, and make you feel. But uh, like you said, we have a we have a lot of catalog. Then there's a lot of mixtape joints that I, I don't even know the name of that I could say, you know, there's songs like Chest to Chest back to back. And, you know, niggas done started something. Those bring out feelings that's kind of undescribable. It's different vibes and different moments in hip hop. Uh, it's different ways you look at things. So those, those, the songs I just mentioned all hit me in different ways for different reasons. And uh, just bring me back like, uh, niggas gonna start this song always reminds me of early Rough Rider days and the hunger that it took to make it. And then knowing we had something before the world knew it and had the confidence to, to truly, truly believe, you know, you, you have to have big nuts to believe you're better than everybody. Like it just, you gotta have some pair, a pair of cojones on you, you know what I mean? So that's uh, those days and just how we made it and how determined we were, it, it you know, just a reflection of Yonkers grit. Listen, I'm gonna tell you something. All of the hits that you talked about were great. But for me, on the mixtape side, I was in college and I was, you know, grabbing mixtapes on 125th Street and going back to Pennsylvania and went to school. Mm -hmm. I was putting all the guys in my college up on, you know, the lock stuff that they wouldn't see until like a month later, two months. And for me, while I was getting ready for finals and midterms, the song that was on repeat in my dorm room was Kiss Your Ass Goodbye. Mm -hmm. That's my shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because, and I'll share this with you, I, I have, a, I have a, a family member who was born with Danny Walker syndrome. He couldn't talk. And the doctor said he would never be able to talk. And basically, listening to the locks and Kiss Your Ass Goodbye and him hearing the song over and over again, he was singing it. He was hard. You could make out what he was saying, but because wow. he was full of talking people, that song got him talking. And wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, on the music side, aside from just the streets listening to it, you never know who you're touching outside of that. Definitely. Yeah. I'm curious, do you have a top five of favorite songs that you've collaborated with someone on? Ooh, that's a, that's a, uh, I want to go with Big Last Days. Jay-Z's Reservoir Dogs. Myself and Black Thought on numerous occasions. Myself and MOP. I love the, I mean, I'm gonna name six because I love the, I love the Havoc in Myself project, Wreckage Manor. And I also love the uh, Beloved project with me and Davies. So you named your starting five and you gave your six men. It's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. With so many groups that have fallen out, what has been the thing that has created lasting power for the locks? Loyalty. Loyalty and putting a putting a brotherhood before before you put before you put money. See, money comes and goes. Like, you know what I mean? You you can make money, you can lose it. Like if if people study most billionaires and multimillionaires have been broke a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Somewhere inside of them, they had the DNA and the structure to know that they're the cause of making the money, not the situation that's there. The situation helps you make the money. Of course, you need the situation to make money, but who you are is really the attraction of money. And uh, uh, to know who you are and know what you stand for and stand for something more than money it, it is a more purposeful lifestyle. Like loyalty is going to be more in the end than a, than a dollar bill because the loyalty will keep you getting back. Your character and who you are, that's that's who people people remember. Like, uh, I, I got a saying, I don't look up to anybody because they have more than me because I'm never going to look down on somebody who has less than me. So with having that understanding and the understanding of, uh, you, I, I could lose millions of dollars today and get millions of dollars back. You lose a loved one, you don't see him till you get to the other side, and you just have you lost something physically that you can't get back. 
So I think you need to cherish people you love and people you rock with and, and you have a connection to more than you cherish a dollar. And I think that's uh that stands for me and my my two brothers in the group. And I think that's why we we're here. We we took an oath early to say uh we're not gonna let money or outside people split what we have. Uh, any problems we have, we should be able to talk it out and discuss it amongst us and not tag other people in. And it's, the world's business is not your business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think when you, when, you, when you stick to that, you end up getting a long run together. Scoopy Radio uh, on the line with SP the Ghost, SP the Monster, Styles P, brother. Um, the Dipset versus people have talked about that ad nauseum with you. I'm not going to go it in the, with the <laughs> We saw it, right? But I'm curious. As great as the versus was, what if versus was to to make this relaunch that people discussed? What two groups do you think could go head to head and make the impact that you guys made? You guys did it. I I don't even know. I would say. Uh... Outcast may first the Fuji's maybe or some shit like that. Some some something way out the box. But I think the impact we had was due to a lot of things. I think uh versus prior to us was everybody like well most of them, not everyone, I can't say that. People looking cool and being relaxed and no one really showing what their particular skill set was. We knew that and we said we're gonna bring our skill set there show the young and something that they haven't seen. Then on top of it, you know, New Yorkers, we just act a certain way. So New York is a very competitive place. So it, I, I believe it took two New York groups. It was like a title fight that night. So it was just a different energy. That's the only two groups I could think of that has such an impact that, uh, that people may want to see, you know, go head to head. Or Outcast versus Goody Mom. Yeah, because that's, yeah, that's still the same region. I would say Outcast versus Goody Mob. Actually, I would put Outcast versus Goody Mob over Outcast versus the Fugees because then you would have that fam fam familiarity. Uh, they're both from the Dungeon family, but they're both two totally different entities. Uh, you also have uh, the far outness in my brother CeeLo, the far outness in Dre 3000. And then you still got the the, the grittiness of the rest of the group. So I think it just, I think that would be something something worth saying. No, that's real. Styles, I'm curious, keeping it versus and keeping it competitive, in your mind, what is the biggest beef or battle that the Locks has had or that you have been a part of? I, I would say, I would say us versus Rockefeller. Okay. One, because it was personal and we, we kept going at each other. So I, I would say that. And uh, yeah, I would go with that one. Who is your favorite producer that you've worked with? I have a feeling I know who you're going to say. Oh, man, you can't ask me that, man. It's it's too many. It, it, it actually is really too many because it, and then I always feel bad because I forget somebody later. But see, when people ask you that, they don't understand it. it it's like going cooking somewhere. Sure. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. you're literally making something from scratch with someone. Uh -huh. So it's different vibrations and different energy each each time. Like, uh, I love working with Vinny Idol. He's one of my favorite producers, one of the lots. Uh, he he understands us, understands what we do, do well. I love working with Alchemist. He's, he's, he's a mastermind. I love working with Havoc. He's a mastermind. Primo, he's a mastermind. Pete Rock, Swiss, Dame Grease, PK, Scram Jones, Static Selector. It's almost too many to name, to be honest with you, because you get a different feeling every time you deal with someone someone different, and different people bring out different energy with you. It's so hard to describe because it's just like a, it's really an energy feeling. And you know when you're sitting there and they're working and they're cooking up, and it's like, Oh, I can see what this is about to be. Oh, the hitmen too. I can't forget that. Uh, the dumb gentlemen. It, it's just a different energy when you know what's going to happen before it happens. 
but you're not sure how it's going to happen. So with each one of them, they have such different personalities, but they're also invested in what they do, what they do, that it's just, uh, uh, imagine sitting there and just feeling someone's energy. And, and you know, sometimes I like Al, Al, cause he smokes a lot like me. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, and he goes, I'm looking at his scrapbooks and all sort of shit. I like I like I like Primo and Pete because you don't even know where they're going and then somehow they're there. It's just like they're playing with a few keys, few drums, and you it just goes from nothing to something incredible fast. Uh having it is it, it's just too hard to explain. And I, I, I really don't know because Monday I may want one, Tuesday I might want to work with the other, Wednesday a different thing. And it also depends on how you're feeling as an MC because these are people you have to be prepared for to see when you go see them. Like, you know, you're going to have to uh, open your mind up to, to, to reach a level that you, you know, that's beyond. Do you have a, maybe two producers that you haven't worked with that's on the wish list or the, of guys you like or a woman that you'd like to work with? I would like to work with Salam Remy, definitely. I'm pretty sure I rhymed over something he's done before. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Maybe not. And uh, as a young fella, I like I like uh, I like Metro Boomin a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you know who I forgot? I forgot about uh, I forgot about A Rap Music. He's incredible to work with too. I mm -hmm. forgot uh, uh, what's my homie out of Philly? Damn, my mind's up. Got little beef. Yeah, Jalil and A Rap too. They have they bring something so different to the table as uh. So it's, it's, it's so many. So I would say uh, Metro Boomin and, and Salam Remy. So look, I um, when I was in college, I watched Jay-Z's Fade to Black DVD two million times to the point that I had to go. Oh, just Blaze? How could I forget him? He's, oh my God. See what I'm saying? This goes, oh my God. When you work with Just is crazy too, because he, he's like a, it's like working, a, a watching a scientist go to work. He's like a madman. What about Timbaland? And Pharrell, have you worked with them? Yeah, yes, I have. See, you mean it's too many. I, I can't, I can't do this. That's why I said I can't do this. This is, this is too much for the mind. Yeah, but it's, it's a lyrical exercise. It's definitely yeah, it's, it's introspective. Um, so any answer that you give, I'm sure people have dissected it because um, they want to know. They want to know. Yeah. When I speaking of Timberland, when I was in college, I watched Fade to Black about. Two million times, literally, to the point that the DVD, I had to buy a new one. And <laughs> I remember there was a part where Jay was in the studio with Timbaland, and he played that, um, what, what ended up being Ludacris's Hey, Jordy, what it is. Do, 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 do. And Jay passed on it. He ended up doing Getting Dirt on Your Shoulders and passing on that, that potion Ludacris song. Maybe a couple years ago, McDonald's used that song in a commercial. Here's my question for you. Was there ever a beat that you passed out that somebody else got and it became a hit? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Like, we like we didn't like Benjamins when we heard it. And I'm not on Benjamins, yeah. Like, none of us liked it. We all laid verses to it. Uh, obviously, my verse didn't make it. But I didn't really care because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like the beat and then uh, to rhyme over. And then, you know, it, be, it became a huge hit. Uh, me and T.I. used the same beat. That actually is part of me. Uh, this helped me go independent. Uh, I did it as favorite drug. I forgot what, uh, what uh, T.I. used, but. Doom, doom, doom. But you want to go and do that, 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 your relationship is so wack, wack. That came out in 05 or 06. Yeah, I, I used it. The labeling, I told them to drop it at a certain time. It's a certain thing. They didn't hear me. He used it. And then it was like, and it was like, I told y'all. I told y'all. So that was definitely one of them. One of them also. And uh, I'm pretty sure some others I just can't remember off top. Who's on your Mount Rushmore rap artist? 
Oh, I'm gonna go with the first four I, I named earlier. If it's gonna be a Mount Rushmore, I would need a couple of mountains to make this. But my first one, initial one, would I would pay the homage to the Grandmasters and put uh, Rakim, Fuji, Kane, and KRS up there. Million dollar question. Lyrically, do you think that Jay Z has surpassed Biggie? No, I don't. I don't. I don't say anyone surpassed Big because Big didn't have the fair shot to be around as long as he should have and I believe he set the tone and uh, I believe in hip hop we do too much comparisons especially of people who are not around I think there is no rap game where it's at I don't think Jay Z makes it to where he's at uh, The Locks makes it to where he's at uh, a, a bunch of us if it wasn't for Big and Pac actually setting a certain tone standard and bar in the rap game for you to keep up to the bar so people people often say that someone surpassed someone or someone is better without realizing who's the people who set the standards yeah and i think you can't compare anyone to people who set the standards especially if they're not around anymore like yeah. big big sophomore album was a, a double album which you considered you know at the time for a sophomore MC to put out a double album with no misses. Uh, basically, here's why I put Big over uh, all, all, all MCs from our generation on and on, is he had different, he fit every category. Like a, a great MC is usually good at two things, maybe three things. Like I'll say myself, for example, you know you're gonna hear some gangster shit from me. You know you're gonna hear some conscious shit from me. And you know you're gonna hear some hippie shit. Now there's other people you're gonna hear fly, lady talk, smooth, king of New York shit, rhythm, flow, big, had a flow, he had wordplay, he make a lady song, he could make some shit like bone thugs, um, joint, gangster shit, a story. So he was he's a he was a well rounded MC. I felt he I felt he was the most versatile. I don't think I've to this day I haven't seen anyone that versatile. To this day. I mean you think about categories that he fit and for him not to be around that long, I think that kind of says everything on his own. Two things. One, I think that what you just said is kind of the argument that I would have about the basketball argument of the GOAT because comparing Michael and LeBron doesn't make sense because LeBron's play style is more like Magic and Oscar Robertson called yeah. this thing to Michael stylistic wise the way he walked the way he chewed his gun the way he, he yeah and so to me it's a fan's argument but you still got to look at the Kareem you still have to look at Magic you still have to look at Bird and so to encapsulate hip hop going back to rap to just this, 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 you have to do it in errors, not in this person and that person. And Kobe, like Big, are both not Exactly. There's like a lot of people, like I, I like I, I like to chalk it up, especially with sports. I like to say, uh, like there's people older than us who'll say Bill Russell was better than the Jordan because of, of the rings. He won 11, like you, you get what I'm saying? So. I think you have to take it from what you were able to visualize. And then sometimes you're having a, a like, this just happened in the barbershop a, a couple of weeks ago. A, I asked the kid, I, he was talking about comparing LeBron and Jordan and how LeBron was much better. And then I asked how old he was. And he was either 29 or 30. I was like, so you didn't even, how old were you when you watched them? He said, I seen the highlights. I said, we're not having this conversation. I said, I can't even argue with you because you're having a biased conversation. You're comparing someone's career you watched to somebody's highlights you heard about or talked about. And then there is no LeBron if it wasn't for MJ. As if, they, you know, that, that happens. Every generation before you is responsible for paving the way for your generation. Like, and that's something you have to, you, you, you have to notice and you have to take, uh, take into consideration. Like MJ went six for six, no game sevens. Like you know what I'm saying. So it's different comparisons you can make, and and like you say, Le LeBron is a physical specimen. 
MJ was a regular size NBA dude and, and did that. So there's different comparisons you could make and many things you could go off. But I always say you have to look at who set the bar and who set the standard and never forget that. Who does Drake and Kendrick's beef remind you of? No one's. Their own. It doesn't remind me of anything in the past because I haven't uh, seen anything like it uh, before. I, th I think with social media, I think all of the beefs I've witnessed prior to this, uh, uh, mainly from my era, that, uh, that were at least very impactful, and no social media was involved. Not on a grand scale. So it was word of mouth, word of the streets, word of people and crews having different uh, opinions, but it was never to the point of, like, I've seen social media stats on how many people liked the song, how many people disliked the song, how many people, you know, were not fans of Kendrick, then when he's winning, they're a fan. How many people were fans of Drake, then when he's losing, they're not a fan, and vice versa. So I would say it's nothing like I've ever witnessed within my career. It was something definitely new. And I'll also say, uh, J. Cole's the winner for making sure he took care of his mental health and stepping out of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then... Uh, uh, I laughed at thinking about how Future set up everything and then kind of faded out. It was like, he's, he's, let me let y'all clear each other out and I'm, I, I'll be here chilling. He threw the rock and hit the hand. Yeah. <laughs> Your thoughts on Cam and Mace teaming up again? Love it. Love it. I, I don't like to see people uh, who started off together and who are homies be separate and it's beautiful to be able to see them winning on a whole different platform. Uh, some energy is meant to connect and keep continuing on. And I believe, you know, those two guys are two really awesome dudes. Uh, I believe they had love for, have love for each other, had love for each other. The industry uh, does things to make shit separate. And I think to be grown enough and mature enough to get back together and then make a difference in their lives in each other's lives and uh, create something that we've, we haven't seen as far as in the sports platform is pretty awesome. What made Freeway and Beanie Siegel such a tandem together in rap? I think, I think that potent Philadelphia, Philadelphia style. I think that that grittiness that uh, people from Philly have, the city of brotherly love, and then the love they have, and then just, uh, it was so raw, so raw and fresh. I think it was just something uh, hip, hip hop heads love. Like hip hop heads love people who are, who, if you're aggressive and you mean it, but you're meaningfully aggressive as well, it, it means a lot. Like when you're saying shit that people can understand, feel in their heart, and, but you're delivering it in a way that's uh, powerful. I think that always is, that always uh, resonates with people. If you could compare Jada Kiss's skill set in rap to a basketball player, past or present, who would it be and why? Uh, hmm. That's a good question. That is a very good question. I, I would say, as uh, he told you, he's like the Black Mamba of the vocal. So I'm going to give him, I'm going, I'm going to give him a, a I'm going to give him Kobe. Yeah. I'm going to give him Kobe because uh, he definitely anytime he steps into the arena, puts his work ethic in it. Uh, you know, you know, he, you know, he's going to get his shit off. You know, you can't stop him, and know you, you know you gonna love him seeing him do it we talked about today's hip -hop. we talked about Drake. we talked about kendrick but what i find interesting you your instagram you be having me cracking up when you say you don't play the pause game you grown um yeah things that you say to that don't necessarily resonate with 17 to 24 maybe you're respected but i, I guess my question for you is like are you one of those old heads that looks at rappers today and you kind of like, uh, like, what is your stance on today's rapper? 
Oh, it go. It depends on who it is. Like I don't, I don't put them all in a group in one group. I, I'm, I'm an MC myself, so I would think that would be ignorant for me to look at it like they're all the same and they're all mesh. There's a lot of rappers who say shit I don't like. There's a lot of rappers who say shit I like. There's a lot of rappers who, at the end of the day, I say, uh, long as the MC is at the top of the game, I, I I'm cool. Yeah. Like, it's it's a bunch of watered down stuff. Uh, but they all, you also have your J. Coles and your Kendricks and your, uh, you know, you have, as long as somebody like that's at, at top, I'm comfortable and cool. You are of South African heritage. Um, yeah. Um, what is your view on Tyler's fame and words of advice? I think she's very talented. I think she deserves the fame. And my advice would be to keep going. Keep, why stop now? You know? A few more questions. Health-wise, health what got you into the juice business? Uh, being from a neighborhood, I know that uh, lacks healthy choices. Your health is your wealth. Uh, being fortunate enough to move to more affluent neighborhoods than I'm from gave me the opportunity to see how those neighborhoods, the things they have in them, the, the products they have was different from where I came from. And uh, knowing that if you want to be successful, you got to really start off with taking care of yourself to the bare minimum. Uh, having a great wife who was concerned about my health and giving me information. Uh, having homies who owned the juice bar prior to me owning the juice bar, my partner and I, and going there seeing the difference the juice made in my life. So all of these things play part in me uh, wanting to bring juice to the community. And you also have the pharmacy. Yeah, that's where we're at right now. Tell me more about it. We sell black seed oil, oil of oregano, sea moss, sour sap, BCD, sea moss, wet bladder rack, uh, oil of oregano, an array of mushrooms for your mind, uh, things to keep the pencil writing. It's just, uh, we look at it as a holistic approach to preventative measures. So, you know, a lot of people don't go to the doctor. A lot of people don't have health insurance. The best thing you can do after that is practice uh, eating as well as you can for, you know, whatever, however it works for you, whether that's plant-based or non-plant-based, having a diet that's pretty uh, balanced and taking things in that works for you. And then also uh, working with these herbs and um Herbs and oils right here. These minerals will get you right. I like it. I like it. You talked about your wife. Uh, what are the keys to a healthy marriage? Shut up and keep it moving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He get you you let out your rage on the microphone, but you but you you shut up and keep it moving. <laughs> and listen. Listen, they're usually much wiser than we give them. The, uh, my wife says pretty much all the smart shit to me. <laughs> all the smart moves, like, I, wait, I'm in here because of uh, her. You know, she's, she's the reason Pharmacy for Life is. So sometimes you got to shut up and listen. I like it. I'm glad I was able to shut up and listen to you, a wealth of knowledge on all things hip hop. Uh, knowing the greats, throwing in a little bit of sports, health, and life lessons. Mr. Styles, you are officially off the hot seat. Love is love, bro. Yes, sir. Thank you, brother. Love is love. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you.